Okay, so welcome to our webinar by Alberta Homeschooling Association on Help My Child Won't Do the Work. Um, this is always, always a very popular webinar. And tonight, um, feel free to ask questions. I can pause this platform if you want and answer your personal questions. And if you want, feel free to, um, if you want to wait till the end, I can unmute you and we could talk. Or if you just want to ask questions in the chat box, I could probably look at those too. Although once I'm on a roll, I'm on a roll. <laughs> just saying. <laughs> Okay, so we're gonna move forward here. And who am I? My name is Judy and I have been homeschooling for 20 years this year. I'm a mom of five children. They range in age now from 17 to 28. So I have um, three university graduates and I have four and a half scholarship recipients. <laughs> one current university student and one child who's in self-directed high school. So I'm almost done, yay! <laughs> um, and I've what I do for my work is I teach child development. So I want to put a spin on that tonight on let you kind of know what's going on in the brain of children in the school age years and why we need to maybe just modify what we're doing a bit to get a bit more cooperation. And I'm gonna finish off with some tips, okay? So we have new books out. We have the Happy Homeschooling Handbook, which um, is not sponsored by any school authority. So um, it kind of talks about the real scoop on home education and online schooling. I also wrote a book last year called Unschooling to University. It's based on 30 of my friends' children um, or my children's friends <laughs> that unschooled, which is self-directed education. So they chose what they wanted to learn anywhere from three to all 12 years and still managed to enter universities and colleges and tech schools with qualifications. So Somewhere around the, along the way, they learned all they needed to learn through play. I've also had published some parenting books. Um, one is how to get a grip on our anger and stress and help our children deal with stress. And the other one is how to um, solve problems and guide behavior without using any punishments. So as you probably noticed by now, I am, a non-punitive advocate. So if we have to punish kids to get the school work done, that's probably not what you're gonna find in the seminar tonight. And feel free to find us on Facebook. And I think every parent needs a tip jar. I mean, <laughs> parenting's hard enough without combining that hat of teacher. And you guys are totally amazing for doing that. Um, I also put a wife's tip jar once in the laundry room and I put a $50 bill in there to set the precedence and I wasn't getting a whole lot of tips. So I don't do laundry anymore except for my own. <laughs> Yay. And I think teachers are amazing. They should have a tip jar on their table. Um, they work under incredible pressures and restrictions. And yet um, with that, they do the best job they can do in a classroom type environment. This is copyrighted 2019. And let's just assume we want to leave all the doors open. So we don't want to cut our children off of anything. Uh, whatever they um, plan to go into, we want to support them in that. Okay. So, and there's no silly questions. Feel free to ask away. Okay. I'm going to actually turn off my video because it's distracting. I didn't have time for a shower today, so I'm like, how's my hair looking? <laughs> Sorry. Even, even when your kids are grown, some days your days are so busy you don't get a shower. <laughs> so, 
Okay, I just want to go over a little bit about what's happening in um, the programs you're on and maybe it very much makes a difference which program you're on in terms of how much you're responsible for what your child does or doesn't do. <laughs> so let's start there. So in Alberta education, there are three quadrants here where you are absolutely not responsible for your child getting the work done. That's public or Catholic school or online, teacher directed, um, what do they call it now, blended, any of those programs, you send your child to a teacher and the contract is between the teacher and your student. It's not between you. They report to you what they have been doing. Um, the next one, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> Good, other people don't do laundry either. <laughs> the next one is private schools and same thing too. Um, you send your child to a private school and they take care of it all. They teach the Alberta program of studies and you just have to oversee homework if you agree to allow that into your house. I know when my kids went to public and private schools, um, we decided we weren't doing homework and that was our boundary. So um, you could choose to do that too. But it's a little harder when they actually do all their work at home. Another one is charter schools and that's they have to follow the Alberta Program of Studies as well, which is those 1400 outcomes per grade that they have to check off. And again, they too teach the Alberta Program of Studies. You're not responsible. So here in the bottom quadrant is where you are responsible, home education. So you are responsible for your child's education program. Whether or not you want to outsource that teaching to somebody else is up to you. You can hire tutors. You can get your, your sister to, to teach the kids. You can go in a home education co-op where somebody else teaches your kids. Or your children can self-teach through unschooling. Either way, responsibility is on you. Okay, but the beauty of that is you can let your child go at their own pace. You do not have to cover a grade in a year. In fact, if you want to take three years to go to cover grade two, you can absolutely do that. There are no rules, unlike the other three systems, where you have to cover a certain amount by a certain time. The deal here is you have to cover the 22 outcomes of the schedule of learning outcomes for home education students that do not follow the Alberta Program of Studies. When do they have to cover that? By age 20. Whew, that's a lot of time. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> now, the only exception to this is when you go shared responsibility. So that is half home education and half one of these other threes. So you are responsible for your half, but the teacher is responsible for your child's learning in the other three or the other half of your program. So, okay. And when we say responsible, like I said, nobody's going to come knocking at your door and say, oh, you didn't teach little Jared science this year. Um, absolutely not. Uh, progression is observed through your springtime facilitator visit where um, he or she comes out and says, oh, did your child progress at all in those 22 outcomes this year? And every child progresses no matter what, if they breathe, they're learning. So <laughs> they all progress, measured against themselves, not against a classroom, okay? So be sure when you're looking at this, you're on the right program and you know who is responsible 
for your child turning in that essay. Okay, on these three programs, it's the teacher responsible. It is not you. You're the parent who supports your child, just like a parent with a child in a classroom. You make sure that they get their homework done. You make sure there's cookies baked for the classroom project that your child volunteered for, those kinds of things. Only on home education are you responsible for your child's education. Good, clear as mud. Okay, now keep that in mind. This is drawn from Inspiring Education, which were a series of stakeholder talks. Oh my gosh, they were like 10 in the last 10 years, 2009 and 2011. And this is where all the stakeholders decided that people learn. So as you can see, school is only second from the bottom, but it's one of many ways that children learn. So keep in mind, even if your child is doing 20 minutes of schoolwork a day, they're still learning the rest of the 24 hours that they're breathing. Now, if you look at unschoolers, they don't do any formal education or structured work. Um, maybe most of them don't do textbooks or workbooks or curriculum, and their children are born playing. And at age six, we don't say, okay, you gotta stop playing now, you have to do schoolwork. We say, go for it. <laughs> and they keep playing and playing, playing, playing all through the teen years. Of course, a teen's play looks a lot different than sitting on the ground with Barbies and Bionicles. Um, it can be um, researching on the internet, it could be playing video games, it could be setting up projects, going to makerspace, those kinds of things. And then what they do is they brush up a bit on exam preparation, write the diploma exams, and then scooch off to post-secondary. And a lot of unschoolers do this. So I, I present this to you just to assure you that if you're not getting work done, it's okay. Children are going to learn what they need when they need it. And if it's not today, they will learn it sometime down the road. They will not miss out. Okay, so <laughs> our story is I started homeschooling in 1999 and I was gung-ho. I brought the school into the home. I replicated it there. I was had our kitchen table set up. I had our curriculum. I had our workbooks. I had that big box sent to me from the school. And I didn't know it at the time, but I actually was on a school teacher directed program. But the box came to my doorstep without a teacher. So I thought, okay, I have to deliver all this. <laughs> and I had two, I had a grade two and a grade three -er, And I had a um, precocious preschooler and I had a nursing toddler. So I like to say we are homeschoolers that never got around to homeschooling, but we tried. And it was probably November of the year. And this is why I like to present this webinar in November, because the honeymoon is worn off. And the kids are sick of learning through textbooks and workbooks. And they start to dawdle. And it takes hours to do something that should be done in 10 minutes. And I'm yelling at them and they're crying. And it's becoming not fun. And that's the point where I thought, okay, if I'm doing this much yelling, I may as well just send them back to school and the teacher can yell at them and I'll be the nice mom at the end of the day. But I didn't want to do that and they didn't want to do that. So we kind of slid into unschooling, which is just empowering them to play. And we did that for the next 10 years. And they learned so much through their play. They would watch magic school bus videos and 
and um, they learned all of grade one to eight science that way. So I wanted to really put a value on relationship and that is what is more important. They're always gonna learn fractions, but don't sacrifice your relationship for getting the work done. Okay. Now, I know everyone is not going to be an unschooler and many par parents, especially first time homeschoolers are very uncomfortable with unschooling. And that's okay. So let's talk about how children come to a more formal school structure and their brains. So as you can see from birth to age six, the brains are growing rapidly in their connections. And by age six, they start pruning them on a use it or lose it basis. So if your child, say, has been in French preschool and you decide to pull them out and homeschool, but you don't do French, they're going to lose their French progress. If they keep on learning French, then they keep those connections strengthened. And when the brain is pruning those things that aren't used, um, they will keep what's being used. So we know from research, um, I've been certified in the brain story, and I'm also certified to teach the growing brain from zero to three. So I love to give you the biological background of what I recommend. And when I say relationships are the absolute context for learning it's really important that you know it doesn't stop at age six we know from zero to six relationships are important we encourage parents to talk read sing respond give your child attention but that does not end at age six brains are growing till age 25 and they need adult relationships all the way through much more so than curriculum. Okay, so in Alberta, we're lucky. Our program of studies um, is outcome-based, not method. So when your child is in a school program, the teachers have to cover 1,400 outcomes per grade. So that's across English, math, science, social studies, health, um, phys ed and art and music in the elementary years and a little less in the junior high and even less in high school. But outcomes are targets to meet. So for example, this is grade one. Topic A in science is creating color. Here's the outcome. Identify colors in a variety of natural and manufactured objects. So what you could do is teach that by giving your child a book and memorizing colors. But a much more fun way to do that is to give them little colored blobs of Play-Doh and let them manipulate and play and make cookies out of Play-Doh. And then they can tell you <coughs> what the colors are while you talk about Play-Doh. And of course, you're playing with the Play-Doh too. <laughs> so <coughs> that's the way to meet the outcome. So Alberta education doesn't, doesn't care which method you use to meet the outcomes, just that the outcomes are met. Now, you do not have to follow the Alberta program of studies, but a lot of parents want to because they're worried their child might fall behind. But just so you know, even teachers in school, they do not have to follow particular methodology or resources. They can pick and choose as they wish to. So if something doesn't work for your child, try another way. Try another resource. Try another method, including play. Play is how children learn. You do not have to use textbooks or workbooks. Remember that in school, children are taught to read and write early because most curriculums is delivered that way for mass distribution. It works when you're in a classroom of 30 to 40 kids. That's the only way you can be sure every child gets 
a copy of the curriculum is through paper. At home, you're just dealing with one, two, maybe 10 children, but you have the time and resources to deliver in other formats through play, through field trips, through watching videos, through um, computer games, through toys, through board games, through, I said field trips, right? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> visits to, to places out in the community. You can do that where schools can't. So you can deliver in other formats that are way more fun, like you could have a field trip every day, and you can wait until the child is developmentally ready to use their fine motor skills and do more writing. Um, this picture, oops, sorry. This picture is my kids and they are learning math and science. They're measuring to make a planter. So they're, measure, they're learning area and perimeter. <clears throat> they're learning what plants grow and how to plant them the needs of plants, specific plants, whether they need sun or soil, and they're learning teamwork, they're learning how to resolve conflicts when they fight, and <laughs> they are learning a whole bunch of things I could check off on that Alberta program of studies. So don't think you have to sit around the kitchen table with workbooks, you don't. This is the Cone of Learning by Edgar Dale, and I love this. He talks about what we remember after two weeks. Reading, hearing words, looking at pictures, writing, pretty well, we lose it quite quickly. But 90% of doing a dramatic presentation, simulating the real experience, or actually living the real experience is what embeds it in the brain. And we know that in adult education, Everyone knows that in child education. The more experiential it is, the more it sticks. Sort of. <laughs> I'll come back to that. <laughs> so this is the development of executive function. It compiles four components. Working memory, the ability to hold more instructions in, in the mind, focus, the ability to filter distractions, self-control, the ability to stay um, doing work instead of wandering off to look at what the dog's doing, and planning, figuring out what plan B is if plan E doesn't work. And you can see here from age three to six, there's a big leap in that executive function. And that's why children don't start school till age six. And then from age six, to 13, it kind of plateaus a bit. Age 13 up to 25 is the maximum it's going to reach. And then after that, it's going downhill a little bit. <laughs> but these 13 to 25, that is the prime years that children are going to learn, especially through paperwork, and retain it and focus it. <clears throat> Like I said um, before, that kids don't remember much before age 12. So when I started homeschooling, I thought, okay, we unzip the brain, zip the lid off, we pour all this information and skills in, and then we zip it up again, and it sticks there forever. No, <laughs> not so. When I asked my children, when they were in university, I said, do you remember going to our homeschooling gathering every week um, for different activities? We had like um, the reptile guy come, and then we had a rocks and minerals guy come, and then we had um, <clears throat> science days that the kids would make stuff. They don't remember any of that. All they remember was the Pokemon toy dispenser in the lobby and how I wouldn't let them have it. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> so from age, they remember things in the teen years though. <clears throat> and this kind of fits with brain development, right? So the brain is divided into parts and the cerebellum and the brain stem is the hindbrain. And that's what's pretty well developed at birth. 
um, children need that too for their gross motor to keep their heart and lungs and breathing going all those things for movement but the four lobes of the cerebral cortex are not developed until after birth and up until age 25. So the occipital lobe is very much developed in babies. They can see everything an adult can see at three months. The temporal lobe, that's what's responsible for language recognition, visual memory, and memory and emotional responses. This is most sensitive in the toddler years, <clears throat> especially when they have those big emotions. The top part of the brain, now the brain develops from the bottom to the top and from the back to the front. So these two lobes are primarily responsible for everything we teach in homeschooling. The parietal lobe is responsible for children learning in their five senses. So it's sensory processing through hearing, seeing, touching, tasting, smelling. That's how they learn from the preschool years all the way to the school age years. That's where they learn their language and through their five senses. And again, in the frontal lobe, higher order cognitive skills. So heading into the junior high, high school years, this is especially sensitive in developing thinking, planning, problem solving, um, emotional processing, risk assessment. And of course, that prefrontal cortex is really towards the late teens. <clears throat> so my point here is, as much as possible, use materials to teach that involve the five senses rather than book work. You do not have to make your grade six or write an essay. They have, they still teach how to write a five paragraph essay in first year university. They have the high school years to practice writing that. Um, absolutely, if you're fighting over it now, let it go. They have lots, lots of time to focus, use their executive function to hunker down and do the learning. Dr. Peter Gray is a psychologist at Boston College and his research, he looked at 75 unschooled children and homeschooled children. And he found the least structured education children had from ages zero to 18, the more likely they would be to go on and succeed at post-secondary schools. Um, Okay. All right. So quickly, I'm not really going to go through this. This um, is talks about infants. I kind of talked about that. Here's another slide that shows that. So even though language development is very much in the first year and continues, the higher order cognitive functions are very much in the preschool years and the teen years. Not, and I kind of talked about this now. Okay, here's what I want to talk about. When the teen years come, this is where a lot of children really learn. Um, up until grades one to eight, they can learn every concept of math through play. All of these concepts through play. Um, we learn greatest common multiples by bouncing on the trampoline. We go one, two, and then on three, we jump on our, our butts. Four, five, six on our butts. And later, that helped the kids learn multiplication tables on their own. I didn't teach them. I didn't make them memorize them. But <laughs> I have three kids in STEM careers. They must have learned them. <laughs> and it's really interesting to see how much kids learn here, um, either through lemonade stands or through cooking, through having an allowance, through um, holiday shopping with you, they learn. Integers, they're going to learn this week when the weather drops to minus 30, right? Again, more experiential math. They learned Roman numerals through reading asterisks and obelisks. 
Um, they learned to read graphs and pie charts even before it was taught in grade eight. They learned coordinates through playing battleship. There's always a way to make it more fun. And then we started more abstract concepts at 13 when they were willing, much more willing to sit down and work through curriculum. Okay, so teens are much more suited to paper-based work. Alrighty, um, now I just wanna say a lot of homeschoolers never finish a year. <laughs> they get distracted, they get sick, their kids get sick, they go on holidays, they have, um, relatives drop by, they get a chance to do a really cool project somewhere, everything gets derailed at some point. And they don't finish a year, and they just put their kids in the next grade, and on they go, and they do just fine, absolutely fine. I really like this. If the kids are crying, we stop for the day. If mom's crying, we stop for a year. If we are both crying, we drop it. <laughs> Homeschooling should be relaxed and fun. Remember, it's the relationship that's going to build the brain connections and set that foundation for future learning. Okay, so let's say, so my kids, their first math class was grade eight, okay? So um, there's lots of ways to teach math that are not through workbooks. Either this is a multiplication bingo game, you kind of need a lot of people to play it though. Um, but that's fun. Even real bingo is fun. Uh, this is a story problem book. So maybe not a traditional math workbook, but it's story problems. This is a grid um, that I saw written on a playground. So we used to go to these playgrounds. This was written on the asphalt. We'd skip count, much like we did on the trampoline. Here's a musical times table we play in the car. Yes, I know, it's a cassette tape. <laughs> I would just dump a box of pattern blocks on the table and let my kids free play. And it was great. They came out with all kinds of beautiful patterns. And I think that helped them later in their video gaming, but also in engineering. Same with playing with Lego and other stuff and just playing with manipulatives. These are the things that don't sell at curriculum sales, and yet they're so expensive to buy in the store. Snap them up, because these are the things kids love to play with, and it builds experiential learning for later. For example, if you fill a, three of these cones and put it in the cylinder, kids will find out that three of these make up a cylinder, and and then they'll know that the fraction later is one third of base times height. Here's some more fun stuff, stamps for place value. These are things I did for my son who had a learning disability. These are two foot letters. I put it out in carpet with, you know, carpet tape, <laughs> masking tape here. And to help him, I get him to jump from the two to the three and then back to the two. And then from the two to the two, back to the two. And then the two to the seven, back to the two. To help him, he was a body kinesthetic learner. So it helped him remember which way to multiply. Better than me telling him. And there's lots of ways. And reading, we live in a literate world. So best practices for reading are let kids read whatever they enjoy. And they'll become lovers of readers lifelong readers. Let them read. Um, writing is a real problem when they don't have something passionate to say. Writing follows reading. And when kids have a chance or an opportunity to say something in writing, they will go at it with passion. Um, if they have to write a book report for someone else, not so much. So really all your kids have to write is when they get to high school, really. <laughs> and even if they hate writing in high school, the worst they have to do is challenge the diploma exams in English and social. So there are a lot of ways to express oneself besides writing, either through, and remember language arts, writing is only one of six strands. There's 
reading, writing, speaking. What child doesn't like to speak? Listening, representing, and viewing. Those are all areas of language arts, not just writing. So I would suggest put a six of a value on writing if your child refuses to write. And again, don't force them, let it go, maybe come back in a few months, try again. Science and social are best learned in real life. Um, science is all around us and social studies is too. If you travel, you can go to the zoo, the science center, um, the Glenmore Museum, um, the TELUS science world, um, any, there's great places around the province to go. There's the, um, the Leduc Museum. There's lots of museums. Whenever you travel, we go to museums and science centers and zoos. And that's where they like to learn through hands-on activities. Um, if you can't get out, there's also Google Earth. There's lots of documentaries on YouTube and Netflix. You can learn about social and science in many ways besides a textbook. Here are some ideas where to get hands-on materials. Now I want to go through a few tips that if you really, really want to do book work, what can you do? Okay, first you can give choices in subject matter, time, or place of study. Let your child pick it out. The less, the more choices they have, like parenting, the less they're going to grumble. And be conscious, when's their best time of day? With my high school child now, I don't even approach him till he wakes up at noon and he has food in his stomach. So two o'clock is a good time we actually start covering some required work for diploma courses. But I won't approach him until he's eaten and has a cup of coffee. And I know that about him. So figure that out about your learners. Gotta work for them too. Tip number two, alternate book work days with outing days. Consider helping the child learn in a different way with an outing or field trip instead of books. I've said that. Tip number three, consider giving tests first. And if you can see the concepts are mastered, let it go. Don't give them busy work. It cuts down on boredom. Schools have to because they have to manage time and getting everyone on board. You don't have to. Tip number four, present the material in a fun way and geared to the child's learning style. Are they a kinesthetic, a auditory, or a visual learner? Use lots of learning aids like movies, cookie fractions, board games, action games. Children love to play games. Tip number five, follow interests as much as possible. If not in format, then in content. Um, for example, if the child has to write an essay or book report, maybe he could write it on a topic he wants, like Pokemon or <laughs> Minecraft or whatever. Um, and again, too, go to bat for your child. If they really hate writing, negotiate with a teacher. Maybe he can do a PowerPoint presentation. I know in schools, they, especially in school control programs, they need output. They need um, your child to produce things, but that contract is between the teacher and your child, not between your teacher and you. You do not have to produce anything. It's your child answering to your teacher. And if your child doesn't produce anything, they're like most kids in classrooms. Um, if they don't produce anything, they don't. There is no repercussions other than they might get a bad mark. <laughs> But that's your child, that's not you. And also keep in mind for those school directed programs, those marks to grade nine don't go anywhere. They go into a child's CUME file, which you know bounces from school to school wherever they go. But the real transcript starts in grade 10. That's where marks are posted. And for scholarships, the really, really important marks are grade 12 year. And those are the ones that count for post-secondary. Most post-secondary um, institutions do not base their admission decisions on 
the entire high school transcript. It's mostly based on the five grade 12 courses and the average mark of those five courses. So don't worry about assessment. Tip number six, use rewards if they work for your child. I know you won't be doing it always. I can't see you. <laughs> I'm sure you're not gonna give your 15 year old a, a reward for getting an essay done. <laughs> but for, you know, ages six to 13, sometimes it works. Stickers, passes for fun outings, computer time or choices from parents. Um, so whatever, whatever works for your child. Tip number seven, whatever you do, avoid power struggles. Put your relationship first. Try and approach learning another way. Listen to why your child doesn't want to do the work. And if it comes to that, let it go. It's not worth having a power struggle over. For number eight, for those hesitant writers, try being the scribe while the child dictates ideas. So you could hammer it out in the computer. Um, the child could verbally tell you, or you could even get um, some software, Dragon software for doing that too. A lot of children will write on computer because it's easier on little hands, so um, there's no problem turning in written work. However, I know from four kids in university that once they get to university, they have to learn to handwrite. My 22-year-old is has taught himself to handwrite this past year. <laughs> <laughs> and he did it in three months. Yay! Because when the need's there, they go to it. <laughs> um, and I'm hoping that'll change by the time your kids get to university, that a lot more professors will allow laptops in the classroom and in exams, but not, not recently. Tip number nine, for those hesitant readers, try picking up an enticing children's book and reading it out loud. Your child might join you if it's not forced, and that's the key. Don't force it. Nudge, but don't force. And model reading yourself. Cuddle on the couch with a child and make reading a fun, cozy time and follow their lead. If they get up, they've had enough, that's fine. Use vocal variety and stop when your child's not interested anymore. Tip number 10, keep a routine going when you figure out the best time of day for book work. This has to work for you and your child. Not all children are morning people. Um, stick to a routine though, some kids need it. Tip number 11, this worked really well for us too, is have a written contract each week, month or year that is signed and agreed to by the parent and child about what work must be completed for that time period. Um, in fact, this is what my son programmed on my computer just to keep me focused and not going off on Facebook. <laughs> that comes up when I deviate from what I want to do. <laughs> Tip number 12, work with the child that is most interested in the topic. And then, as you know, other siblings will join willingly if they're interested. If they're not, wait a while. Again, if the topic's forced, the retention of knowledge will be minimal. They may be more interested in a few months or a few years. Okay, so again, don't force it. Um, children often learn better by discovery than by being told. And there's always a willing teacher either out there in the world or in the community. Number 13, some months and years are better than others. Children go through spurts and plateaus and most do not learn in tidy sequential steps. Contrary to the nice, tidy, sequential curriculum in schools, children do not learn that way. The more we know about the brain is that even, even so, even if one lobe isn't, isn't um, work by itself it all works together in different ways so um, during a plateau trust that the desire motivation will come back and definitely come back in the teen years you'll get so much more cooperation then number 14 assimilation of material takes time plan for playtime, downtime and lots of breaks 
Keep sessions short. I've learned that. Use a timer and have something fun to do after. Do not um, go for longer than 30 minutes in elementary and an hour in junior high and two hours in high school. That's about the attention span of kids these days. In fact, the attention span of adults is 40 minutes. I hope I'm not quite there yet. <laughs> Seriously, um, keynotes are getting shorter and shorter because attention spans are getting shorter and shorter. Um, there's a lot of 20 minute keynotes now that um, meeting planners request. Tip number 15, create a learning environment of fun, curiosity, and good feelings. If your child wants to go off on some other topic, follow them, right? They will come back to the topic you're at at some point of time or year. But go with what they're really excited for now because that's what builds those brain connections. Make sure everyone's fed, rested, comfortable, and non-stressed. This is um, one of my children. They're doing food studies 30. They made a cabbage pie and they put a sign up for the course, the number, the date. Um, that's how you get self-directed home education credit for high school. Tip number 16, make sure they've had enough exercise. Young children need lots of energy burning activity until age 13. Again, in the teen years, they're more willing to sit down and do things. Until then, they move, they want to move. Last, number 17, never punish for not doing the work. You want to create a climate for lifelong learning and enjoyment of the pursuit of knowledge. Remember your job is to facilitate learning, even when you're responsible on a home ed program. Nudge, but don't enforce. Lots of encouragement and letting go. As I love Pat Faringa, and he's He's um, taken uh, over and co-written a lot of books by John Holt. And he says, don't sacrifice your relationship on the altar of curriculum. Keep your relationship and the rest will fall in place. So you, your mantra can be, we'll try another day, another way. Um, you absolutely can't stop kids from learning and you can't force kids to learn. And we all know that. We all homeschool till age six. How many of us try and force our, our um, toddlers to toilet train when they're not ready, right? So having patience, your child will get there. And at some point in time, their education becomes more important to them than you. And that can happen anywhere from age 13 on up. I have found it kind of kicks in around 18, 17. Until then, I'm still more concerned about their education. But yeah, that magical time, and I think that's just that last leap of development of the prefrontal cortex and executive function. And then, thank goodness, when they get to post-secondary, they start taking on their education. There's lots of benefits of, of homeschooling. Um, I find my teens get way more sleep. My son had a 12 hour night last night and that grows brains. So there's lots of benefits. And I would love to open it up for questions now. Um, anything you wanna ask, I'd be happy to. If you wanna write in the chat box, or um, if you want to write something, I can unmute you and we can talk if you'd like. But I want to thank you for coming to this session tonight. Next month is Unschooling 101. Everything you want to know about unschooling, we're going to present the second, is it the second? No, it's the third Wednesday of every month. <laughs> third Wednesday. Okay. All right, we got the chat box going here. Ah, okay. We have a question. How do you deal with screen addiction? Did you limit the screens with your children? And other people are going, yes, screen addiction. 
Okay, so in taking the brain story course and in teaching the growing brain from zero to three, what we know about brains, and, and the brain story course is um, from 30, 49 neuroscientists across North America. It is the most up-to-date research on addictions and um, how it affects brains. What we know is that screen time is one of 10 addictions, right? It's not defined yet as to what constitutes, how much time constitutes uh, addiction. Um, they can't define how much and they can't define how to treat it. So it's not in the DSM-5 and they're still not sure they're gonna put it in the next edition, which is the Bible for the medical community. And the World Health Organization has classified it as an addiction, but without setting um, boundaries as what constitutes addiction. So it's one of 10 addictions. What we know about addictions is that children who come from loving, nonviolent, low stress, functional homes are not predisposed to addictions. So no matter how much screen time they get, very likely it will not affect their brain development nor affect their ability to put that on hold in the teen years and do something else, okay? That is what the current research shows. Now, I know parents like to use that word addiction, but <laughs> screens are compelling, absolutely compelling. They embed hooks in there to keep people playing. But again, I'm gonna go back a slide here. This one. So this one. Um, we say watch the screen time here, no screens because children need to learn language. Then we say moderate the screens here because children learn through five senses. And then here there's no recommendations other than keep it balanced, right? Because children who live in functional, healthy homes are not going to become addicted. Um, but here, if you look at the development of the prefrontal cortex around age 15, that's when kids on their own naturally will put aside a video game and say, I got to get this studying done for my exam tomorrow. I'm not going to game tonight without parents saying, yes, you have to put it away. So this restraint naturally happens. That self-control, that focus, that planning, all naturally happens in brain development in a child that grows up in a functional home, okay? So to answer to my question, I never limited screens at all, being an unschooler. <laughs> um, because I consider them very educational. I didn't consider that, um, I didn't divide any screens into educational and non-educational. It all was educational and it all taught my kids something. Um, nowadays, they're very much lovers of computer games. Um, they all play together in different countries and cities and it keeps them bonded, especially with dad. And it has a lot of advantages. Um, um, my one son is actually working for <laughs> a video game company, so it served him well. <laughs> and he was the one I worried about the most for screen time addiction. So that's the short answer to that question. So um, I guess it's up to every family to decide how much screen time you can tolerate. But um, don't worry, it's all educational. Okay, um, there, there's so much good stuff on the internet. Um, when kids look up and research things they don't know, and when they, um, they, like I said, you can 
you can use Duolingo to learn a language. My kids use Khan Academy to get through high school math and science and even university math and science. Um, they, um, they're very creative. They make memes. They, they play a lot of shooter games, um, but you know, they won't go fishing because you have to kill the fish. So <laughs> at, at age 13, they know the difference between violence on a screen and violence in real life. And yeah, it's, and I know you don't trust that until you actually see it in action, but it, it's again, one of those things you got to trust that, um, you know, um, kids with, with high hay scores are more prone to to addictive behaviors, whatever they would be, whether internet, gambling, eating, drinking, drugs, whatever. So you just want to keep those stress levels down. Okay, any more questions on tonight? Um, I am going to, I've recorded this, so I'm going to put it up on Alberta Homeschooling website. If you would like your partners to see it, that would be um, handy for them. Um, and if you want to refer people to it, that's great too. So I hope that was helpful. Okay, we had a question. How often did you socialize? Um, we went out almost every day because I found with five kids, if we stayed at home, they would bicker and it'd drive me crazy. So I tried to schedule an outing, whether it's a play date or a field trip every, every day. Although some days, like Friday, I was done. I was tired, but <laughs> we tried to. But again, it's up to you and your child. Some children, um, and that's the beauty of home education. You do not have to socialize every day. Um, you do not have to force your introverted child to go to school and, and put on that, that false front. They can set the pace for how much contact they want. And if you have a really extroverted child, that's what playdates are for. Um, the question is, do you think that homeschooling an only child is still a good idea? Yes, there are many, many parents that homeschool um, one child and it's fine. Um, you, I don't know how you feel about sleepovers, but when they meet friends, sometimes they do more sleepovers. Although we did a lot of sleepovers too, but yeah, um, it's fine if they if they let them set the pace for how much contact they want. Yes, you know, driving kids can socialize. Oh, that is nice. When they can drive, it's so nice. Yes, I had quite a few homebodies in my kids, but but then they'd stay home and fight. So <laughs> I, I would get them out of the house into activities and things, especially physical activities. A lot of home educators, they leave Friday open for, you know, really fun stuff. Oh, nice. <laughs> yeah, it's nice when kids can drive and go do their own things. Okay. Um, well, at this point, I think I'm going to just Turn off the recording. So, um, okay. Well, thank you, everybody. I'm glad that was helpful. And <laughs> um, yeah. Oh, we have a question. How much is a support group important? I was, it depends on what you, how much support you need. Um, you know, there's a lot of online support groups, which are great. Um, some people prefer to go to coffee nights and talk to people in person and 
who can show and tell about curriculum and what works and things. So it's really up to you. Absolutely. Oh, you're welcome. <laughs> Okay, well, thank you. And maybe we'll see you in December for um, homeschooling 101. So um, thanks for sharing your hour with me tonight. <laughs> okay, take care, everybody and happy homeschooling.